Okay, so good morning everyone. Um, uh, today we're going to dive into a set of particle filter material that I've never had a chance to present in as in-depth a fashion uh, as I will today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to covering that. Um, but uh, I also wanted to, to make uh, one ad sort of administrative remark and one one remark that um, uh, bears conceptual attention. Okay, um, I'm just trying to find a recording app. Just on the off chance that this won't be recorded, we'll be guaranteed to uh, to to get it. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, so the administrative matter is um, we have a number of classes to still make up, number of sessions to still make up for this course or class. Um, and uh, I know that there's one session scheduled for this Friday. Um, because of uh, the issue with, with illness, I wasn't able to... Uh, to deliver one of the, the course uh, sessions last Friday, and so that's being rescheduled. Um, and then I think there are one or two more at least uh, beyond that um, that Christine will probably be contacting you about. So bear in mind, this is nominally the last week of classes, uh, but at, Christine did ask my permission to stretch the meetings for this class beyond this last week. Uh, I recognize um, potential conflicts with exams um, and uh, I, I think Christine should be contacting everyone here about the timing and we'll commit to timings that work for all of you. Okay, so uh, I appreciate your patience. What it does mean is we have a number of extra lectures still to go and, and extra lectures where we can cover important material. And there's actually a number of really important things I want to cover. Um, not just particle filtering, but MCMC, particle MCMC, and hopefully a, a little bit more. Um, so that's the administrative remark. And there'll be some exercises associated with those as well. The conceptually more substantive remark for your consideration has to do with a misunderstanding that often comes up when a particle filtering comes to the table. Um, and it comes up at two different levels. Um, so sort of people trying to think about how particle filtering compares to traditional techniques like calibration or or for that matter, how it fits in at the second level compared with other machine learning or computational statistics techniques that can also use dynamic models um, such as MCMC. Um, and it has to do with two structures or constructs that are, that are somewhat easily confused in students' minds. Okay, because they involve spaces having to do with a dynamic model. And I, I just, particularly for particle filtering, I want to make sure we're on the same page with this. Because I've, I've seen uh, collaborators, uh, other faculties, um, uh, faculty members who are confused actually sometimes about this issue as well and where particle filtering fits in. And I think it's, it's very important we understand this for its sound use and it's important we understand it to put it in the context of other methods. Okay? I want to distinguish between two types of spaces that we deal with when we're dealing with uncertainty about dynamic models. And I'm, I'm showing them here somewhat arbitrarily in 3D. Um, sometimes they may be less than that, sometimes they may be more, very commonly they're more. Um, but one is a parameter space. This is a space where we're considering model behavior 
as we vary parameters. And each a given point in this space will be associated with, suppose we have three parameters, uh, A, B, and C. Or if I were more, uh, more traditionally inclined, I might say alpha, beta, and gamma, because these are probably uh, commonly used to denote constants, things that are constant for a given run of a model. We might, um, we, we might have a, for, for a given point in space here, we might have a particular value for alpha, a particular value for beta, and a particular value, uh, excuse me, I'm uh, sort of uh, confused in my, how I'm drawing this. We have a particular value for a certain coordinate here. So suppose this is our, our point of interest. This has a certain value of alpha associated with it. It has a certain value of, of beta associated with it, um, sort of the, the value of the height here, and a certain value for gamma associated with it, right? Um, the sort of coordinate that goes into the board. Um, Sorry. So is the yeah. There's a, it's a specific, each axis is associated with a particular parameter. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And a given point in the space will be associated with a particular parameter vector, a particular set of assumptions about the parameter. That this parameter, you know, alpha is 10, beta is 2, and gamma is minus 3, or something like that. So. So we've talked before in this class about parameter vectors. Um, it hasn't been as common, nearly as common as talked about state vectors, but I think we may have mentioned uh, this notion of a parameter vector. And uh, you know, at a, at a simplistic level, you might say a parameter vector specifies the numerical assumptions uh, made within the model, right? So we'll have a given model and it will be specified um, in terms of state variables and so on, but there will often be these parameters that specify specific assumptions which we might vary for different scenarios. We might vary when we're examining different particular conditions with the same general model, right? And a given point of parameter space is associated with a specific assumption of values for these parameters. You look confused. Yeah, because I, I, I think I was just thinking in the context for say do an SIR model. Yes. Then yes. so then the the, the state Good. vectors yeah. will be the S P R in the R Good. and the parameter vectors would that be the values say alpha and beta and gamma that would be talking about yeah. state model. So I so I love your question and you've you've actually um, suggested a very whoa. Are you all right? Yeah, I am. Um, that's a, exciting um, and dangerous. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I'm I'm thinking about reconfigurations that will make this less likely. Um, um, Okay, so if we add the SIR model here, this the, 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 I love your question. Um, we'll have an SIR model here. The state variables here are the stocks, S, I, and R, right? And we'll have flows between them, right? Um, Here we go. Uh, let's suppose it's an SIRS to to add some some uh, you know uh, texture to it. And here, uh, for each of these flows, we'll have some formula um, involving the state vector, the state ver the state vector, sure, the state variables. But it, it can also involve parameter assumptions. Um, uh, and so here, for example. For cases of new infection, we might have a formula, right, that involves S to be sure, I to be sure, 
there's no new infections that are going to occur without infectives uh, to infect them. <laughs> there's no new infections that will occur if there's nobody to get infected. That's the S. But in addition to that, we'll commonly have other assumptions, like C, a contact rate, right? Con uh, so contacts per unit time that a susceptible has with anyone. We'll have beta, which is per discordant contact, per contact between a susceptible infected, what's the chance that, they w that the infected will transmit the infection to the susceptible? And then, commonly we might have another value, uh, uh, maybe we could call it a, a parameter, I'd have to think a little bit, but n, it's the total size of the space, which, which equals uh, s plus i plus r, um, right? Um, and any one time, this is invariant. Um, but c and beta are certainly examples of parameters. There might also be a mean time infected here um, associated with i, right? Um, so, so here the formula associated with this flow here might be um, S times C times I over N times uh, beta, right? For, for that formula. For this it might be, the formula might be I over tau, right? Or tau is the mean time that someone spends infected, right? And maybe we have an omega here, which is a weight of reigning, <laughs> a, weight. a weight of, of reigning immunity. No, that isn't it. Uh, a rate of waning immunity. Um, 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 yeah. Um, uh, so, so here we might have uh, omega times r um, as the formula, right? And so there's some there's some particular assumption about omega will make for a particular run of the model, right? And so we might characterize two sorts of spaces associated with this model. One space has to do with, and at the cost of kind of, you know, reworking a bit of this, I'll just redraw this. Maybe, um, maybe I'll confine my attention here Let's put aside n for the moment, but I'll confine my attention to c, beta, and tau, okay? So we'll have some assumption for c. In for each point in parameter space, there'll be a particular assumption for c, a number of contacts per day that a susceptible undergoes, right? A particular assumption for beta, the probability of transmission per discordant contact, and a certain probability for, oh, and we actually have an omega, too. And so somehow there's got to be a, uh, a parameter, another dimension of this, or another coordinate where we have a particular value for omega, right? So here we might have four coordinates, um, five if you want to consider n, right? Um, and with a given run of the model, we have a parameter vector that has particular assumptions about each of these, right? C, beta, tau, omega, and n. In order to, I mean, to speak intuitively about it, in order for this model to be fully specified, to be well defined, to allow us to examine its behavior, we need to assume a particular value for c, beta, omega, uh, uh, tau, and n, in order to, to sort of arc out what its behavior would be, right? And we call those parameters. Those parameters are static, and I'm using that term specifically here for when I say parameter, I'm meaning a static quantity, a quantity whose value is invariant over the course of the simulation. Its value does not change over time. It's a particular assumption that we maintain for the entire course of a model run, right? Um, and so we might imagine a parameter space where we say, okay, we're doing a run here right now. And for the sake of sensitivity analysis, I'm going to do a run over here and over here and over here and over here and over here in the area around my main point of interest. So when we conduct sensitivity analysis, we are examining, you know, often a, how the model behavior changes over a 
a small region of parameter space. Mm -hmm. When we're trying to calibrate a model, we are trying to identify a single point within parameter space where the behavior of the model best accords with, best aligns with, is most consistent with, exhibits the, less, the least discrepancy from empirical data. So we're trying to figure out what set of assumptions about parameters uh, allow the model's behavior to best match empirical data, right? That's, these are things we do in parameter space. In an MCMC technique, the uh, MCMC, Marco Chain Monte Carlo technique, we're actually going to be sampling from a distribution over parameter space. So we'll be asking, given the empirical data and the model structure, what's the probability, or probability density, um, that the parameters hold this value versus that one per versus that one? And so there may be certain regions of the space that are very plausible given the, the empirical data we have in the model. You know, this area may be very dense, like it's, it's very high probability um, that it lies somewhere in here, but as you go out, it, it's less and less likely that the, that the parameters are way up here, or way up here, or way up here. But in here, you're getting really warm. Or maybe there's a, there's a big trough here where anywhere along this trough is very, very likely. You can't really distinguish, maybe it's an identifiability issue, but out here, you know, you're, you, you, it's very unlikely that you have it. And so, uh, with MCMC, we're actually sampling from parameter values. We're exploring what are the values of parameters that are most consistent with the empirical data given a model. And we are doing that in a probabilistic way that uh, allows us to, to sort of characterize the distribution, the global distribution implied by the model and the empirical data over parameters, right? So we're, we're trying to estimate the parameters. This is parameter space. And if you look at my slides on calibration, which I would have shown in 394A58, uh, there is actually a depiction of parameter space and so on. And it's a very useful construct to ask, you know, okay, what are we exploring in parameter space? And um, uh, there was a 394 assignment where I actually asked the students to depict parameter space as it calibrated where it was going in parameter space. Um, now, there's things I'm not getting into here, like, okay, for a particular point in parameter space, we might associate that with a particular discrepancy from the model, from the model empirical data for the sake of calibration, right? Or a mean discrepancy if the model is stochastic, right? Um, but there's also a whole set of behaviors with the model. Like maybe in this region in parameter space, you know, out, maybe, maybe out kind of here or something, the model exhibits um, oscillatory behavior, whereas in this area it doesn't. There's kind of, uh, there's other things besides discrepancy that are of interest. Or maybe you say this fixed point is stable in these regions and not in those regions. We, we conceptualize that, right? When we derive the, the um, stability of fixed points, that stability depends on parameters often. And uh, so the eigenvalues, if one of them is greater than zero, uh, it's unstable. Um, that depends on the values of the parameters. So in certain regions of parameter space, the, the, the a, a given fixed point might be stable, like a disease-free equilibrium might be stable. It, it uh, sucks things into it. If you disturb it, if you perturb it, it will keep the trajectory there, we'll just suck it back in and we'll just resume, it'll get back into balance. Um, much like a first order delay, we'll get back into balance. If you increase it a lot, it will sort of come back down. So in some areas of parameter space, certain of the fixed points may be stable, like disease-free equilibrium, and other areas of parameter space, they may be unstable. And so we can reason about system behavior in parameter space very fruitfully. It's a very good construct. But this is not the construct that we are exploring today with particle filtering. Particle filtering 
we're talking not about parameter space, but about state space. And uh, here in state space, we have different axes. We're not dealing with parameters, um, varying assumptions about parameters, estimating parameters. No. In, per, in uh, particle filtering, we're talking about estimating aspects of model state sampling from the underlying latent state of the system, much of it latent. So here, for the LAVI, the LAVI concrete model that you brought forward, which is great, um, the, relevant, the relevant axes are not C, beta, tau, omega, and so on, the parameters. No, they're S, I, and R. And, and with, per, with particle filtering, we, we are estimating for a given point in time, we're, we're trying to establish a distribution over this space as to where we are. And, you know, I argued that often we arc out for a given set of parameters, a given fixed set of parameter assumptions, a model's trajectory will, ex will be confined often to small subspaces maybe a manifold within the space. Maybe it'll spiral into something. Maybe it will exist in a, in a, in a simple orbit or what have you. But, um, but we're, with particle filtering, we're seeking to, to identify, for a given point in time, a distribution over the state space. So, well, we're most likely right now, given all the data we've seen to this point, the model structure, yes, including parameter assumptions, you know, we have a distribution, we're probably in this area of the space. Um, this is kind of our high probability density region in here, and further out you go, far less likely that you're out there. So particle filtering is helping us to understand, given observed data, model structure, and, and yes, particular parameter assumptions, where we are right, you know, right now um, within the space. And it does so, as we'll see, via sampling, um, where the samples are called particles. But, um, but the point is we're estimating our position in state space uh, by calculating a, a by, by characterizing a joint distribution over state space, right? This is state. Um, Whoa, um, state space, okay? This is parameter, parameter space. That's a parameter vector, and this is parameter space, you know, uh, here, right? These are two different constructs. Particle filtering is not about estimating static parameters. It's not. And people get confused about this. They think, oh, I could use particle filter to estimate static parameters. No. Uh, uh, that, it turns out, I've heard from several esteemed uh, statistician colleagues, including Dr. Liu, but also others from outside the U of S, that no, you, it's really not legitimate in general to use, uh, parameter, uh, to use particle filtering to estimate um, uh, to, to, uh, to estimate parameter values. Um, you use it to estimate where we are in state space um, at a given time for a given fixed set of parameter values. Okay? Um, if you want to estimate static parameter values, bring on PMCMC. That's, that's what allows you to do that. Okay, now, well, or combine it with calibration, like um, is distinguished in the work of none other than Chen Yang. So, so then, say, particle theory is not the calibration No, right? not. Okay. And this is one of the things I'm trying to drive home, because it may kind of seem similar. It's like we're dealing with uncertainty about the model. We're trying to estimate something from the data. It's easy to kind of fall into thinking we're trying to estimate parameters. We're not, not, N-O-T, not trying to estimate parameters, static parameters here. 
Okay, now you, you'll hear my qualifying words there. I say static parameters. Because what we can do is have certain varying parameters part of model state. And then we can estimate them if there's parameters that vary over time. But we can't estimate static parameters. It's really not a, a legitimate uh, exercise mathematically. So, so with calibration, we're estimating parameters. With and we're trying, and this is the thing that's confusing, and that's why I'm making these remarks right now. With parameter, with calibration, we're trying to estimate where we are in a space um, by bet in such a way that we best match model model results to empirical data. Right? That's what we do. If I, if I can speak informally, that's what we do with, during calibration. And, 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 you know, in particle filtering, we're trying to figure out where we are in space such that the model is, output is kind of most consistent with, or model, uh, model output is most consistent with empirical data. I'm, I'm trying to, to kind of phrase it in a kind of vague way so that you could see why someone could be confused. Because... People are often confused that, oh, oh, uh, particle filtering is a way to estimate parameter values. No, it's not a way to estimate static parameter values. It's a way to estimate state, underlying state. Now, as it turns out, this will be very helpful for estimating parameter values. For, but that's not particle filtering. That's particle MCMC, and that is by, by coupling particle filtering with calibration. You can actually do a better job calibrating a model if you are particle filtering when uh, calibrating. You can actually get better parameter estimates out of it. And there's an interesting thesis from MIT in about 1974 um, uh, when I was around the time I was first running around its hallways, not as a student, <laughs> I should say, um, where, where in, in system dynamics models, the authors did exactly this. Um, they coupled a state space estimation technique with, with calibration. And they found that essentially you can better calibrate if you are doing state space estimation with it. Now, they didn't have recourse to particle filtering. That wasn't invented until many years later, um, until I was walking around the quarters of MIT as a student. But, um, but um, you know, at the time I was a toddler there, um, uh, they were using Coleman filter, um, an extended Coleman filter. So um, those, it's easy to get these confused, but no, we're estimating a part of filtering state space. Yes, the refile. So for example, in my suicide model, I don't have the intent data for Canadian Right. Context. Right. So if I want to estimate that intent, whether for male and female, mm -hmm. so you are saying PMC would be helpful? Right, exactly. If you want to estimate a set of parameters for your model, PMCM together with particle filtering, PMCMC is is a very powerful technique, but the the sort of way to do it, the poor man's version of it, which is still very very good is is you do calibration together with particle filtering. So you actually calibrate the model to to achieve the least discrepancy between a particle filtered model with that parameter assumption and the um, and the empirical data. So the particle filter in general will compute a discrepancy in our models, and for a given per set of parameter assumptions. If you run the particle filter, you will get a, a, a discrepancy report from the empirical data. It's a discrepancy that results from the particle filtering, given all this data that's observed. And you could search in a calibration procedure. You could find the least, dis the, the parameter vector, the parameter assumption, specific parameter assumption. It's like C equals 2, beta equals 3.5, tau equals 1.0. Um, 
that yields the minimum discrepancy. And that is exactly what Jin Yang has done in her thesis to great acclaim. Um, and that will, that's kind of a poor man's version of what you'd get out of particle MCMC. Particle MCMC, you get additional insights as well um, concerning the distribution of those parameters, the joint distribution, et cetera. We'll come to MCMC uh, in this uh, soon enough, probably another two, three lectures. Okay. Um, so parameter space, state space. We're dealing today with state space. We're dealing with particle filter and we're dealing with state space. Particle on CMC, you're dealing with both. Uh, calibration, you're dealing with parameter space. But particle filtering by itself does not deal with parameter on surface. Okay? So, an important distinction. Um, so we are trying, with particle filtering, I'll emphasize it again, given data we've seen till now, and given, given the model structure and a specific parameter vector for that model, we are trying to estimate where we are in state space. Through, we're trying to understand the joint distribution over state space. You know, probably in a region where I is really high and R is medium and S is low. And we will do so via sampling from that. We're not going to mathematically describe the shape of the distribution. We'll have samples from the distribution. We'll be sampling from it according to important sampling, sequential important sampling. That's what, that's what we're doing uh, with particle filter. Okay? Distinction. And it's easy to get confused, so I wanted to make that up front. With that having been said, I am going to now stop that recording. <laughs>